Good evening. And, uh, and I'll say again on Sunday, but just thanks to everyone who sent cards and sent me messages of condolence and your kind uh, thoughts and, and so on. So much appreciated. Um, Sunday. Yes, Sunday. Uh, we have two services on Sunday morning. Um, I don't, I'm, no pressure on anyone, but if there are folks here who come to the sunrise service, I have a question. Would it be pertinent? And it's merely a question that I don't really have a problem either way, but rather than meeting and having a service out there, we could greet, meet out there and then come in. It means we can use these for singing. You know, we can make use of the technology for singing along to rather than trying to sing unaccompanied outside. Um, is that an idea or do you want to? I mean, if it was raining, we'd come in anyway, but. Okay. So, so we'll actually, we can greet folks outside, but we'll come in for the actual service and then we can just go through that door um, for breakfast afterwards. And uh, church is looking lovely with the daffodils and the daffodils are going to feature, I think, this weekend. So thanks to, to Gladys, I think. <laughs> Thank you. They look great. So let us worship God. Let us sing to his praise. Uh, the first time, it's, it's a rather solemn service tonight. Good Friday always is as we reflect upon the crucifixion of our Lord and Saviour. So this is the hymn, There is a Green Hill Far Away. Gracious and loving God, on this Good Friday evening, it is good for us to gather here to worship you, to express our gratitude to you for the amazing love gift of your Son, who willingly took the cup the Father gave to him for love's sake, for our sake. We thank you for Jesus and his cross, understanding that his way of suffering was for our righteousness, peace, and joy. Open our hearts and minds to behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. 
Enable us to look, to listen, and lean upon the one who is the way, the truth, and the life, who has reconciled, redeemed, and renewed us by his precious blood. Help us truly appreciate that the cross had to precede his crown and that his Golgotha was for our glory. Father, forgive us our sin for Jesus' sake, who died for our sin and who rose again triumphantly on Easter Sunday morning for our justification. Have mercy upon us, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out our transgressions, create in us a clean heart and restore a right spirit within us all. Receive from us our sacrifice of praise. Make us attentive to your word and prepare us for the sacrament of Holy Communion, that we might partake and feast upon Christ, his body and blood, by faith. Bless us and build us up in the faith. Bless those who are unable to join with us this evening, but who will do so on Easter Sunday, when we gather to celebrate our Lord's glorious resurrection to your everlasting praise and glory in worship and fellowship. Be with your church throughout our nation and indeed to the ends of the earth. Pour out your spirit upon us all, revive your people, and let all rejoice in Jesus' name, who taught us to say together, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. We're going to sing once again. It's a beautiful hymn, well-known hymn, How Deep the Father's Love for Us.
chapter 19, starting at verse 16, the crucifixion. John 19, verse 16. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. Here they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled, which said, they divided my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. So this is what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there, and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Dear woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Later, knowing that all was now completed, and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Amen, and thanks be to God. Thank you. We shall sing once again another well-known hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross.
go. And um, we've got a long text this evening. It's the words, I thirst. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. On this Good Friday evening, it is appropriate to reflect on Jesus' words from the cross, amongst the very last words that he spoke before he gave up the ghost, yielded his spirit to his Father in heaven. And we do so in readiness to partake of the Lord's Supper, which we do in remembrance of his, that his body was given for us, his blood was shed for you and me. Such is his love for us. He knows us intimately and loves us. Hence consider, Jesus thirsted literally. I thirst. He thirsted because he received an extensive beating, or beatings plural. Remember, he was taken by soldiers in the garden the previous evening. And he was dragged before one kangaroo court to another and was beat upon. And then, of course, came the, the crown of thorns, thorns which were pushed into his scalp. And then, of course, the scourging with its deep lacerations. Reading the history of those times, very often people succumbed. They actually died from the scourging before they even got to any cross for crucifixion, such was the horrendous nature of the deep lacerations that were caused by the metal and glass and bone sh um, shards that were um, part of the leather straps that were used. And then, of course, we understand the subsequent blood loss. And that's why on his way up the Via Dolorosa, Simon of Cyrene was called upon, commanded in effect, to carry Jesus' cross to Calvary. And then came the actual crucifixion, the nails and feet and hands. Jesus likely thirsted, therefore, from physical exhaustion. He's had nothing to eat or drink since the night before when he shared that last Passover meal and instituted the Lord's Supper for his people. And he has been beaten and dragged before one court to another, the authorities. He likely thirsted, moreover, from exposure. Tellingly, he was crucified at nine o'clock in the morning. It is now approaching three in the afternoon. And the time is, is extremely significant. It's symbolic because nine o'clock was the time of the morning sacrifice. And behold, the Lamb of God was sacrificed at nine in the morning. And then, of course, three o'clock was the time of the evening sacrifice. It got dark very quickly in that part of the world, given its proximity to the equator. And so, around about six o'clock, it just gets dark. And so, the evening sacrifice. And these are amongst the last words that he said before he yielded his spirit. But he's been on the cross hanging for some six hours with the sun, although it was darkened from 12 o'clock till three o'clock and the weather and so on. He thirsted, Jesus, however, thirsted lucidly, not only literally, but also lucidly. And I think it's very important that we understand this because Jesus communicated clearly from the cross. And he did so because his words were to be written down and recorded for future generations for you and me so that we might understand the significance of his cross. And he spoke clearly. He spoke, we're told, with a loud voice. It wasn't the cry, the whimper of one defeated and utterly dejected and dispirited but rather it was the cry at the end of the victor who cried out aloud, it is finished. 
That's the reality of it. And then he yielded up. And it's to teach us that no one, as he said, took his life from him. He laid it down and he was going to take it up again. And we shall celebrate that fact on Sunday morning. He also thirsted lucidly in the sense that he communicated considerately. It is a remarkable thing that even on the cross, because his sacrifice was a substitutionary sacrifice and he was thinking of others. Remember his first words or amongst the first words, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And then his words to the the thief on the cross, the criminal on his right hand side. Today, he says, you will be with me in paradise. And then, of course, he looked down and he beheld his mother, Mary. And John, the apostle who describes himself as the apostle whom Jesus loved. And he said to his mother, Mother, behold your son. And to John, he said, behold your mother. And from that hour, John took Mary to his home and she lived there until there her death. Jesus thirsted lucidly in the sense that he also communicated convincingly. It's remarkable that after he yielded his spirit, we read that the captain, the centurion, who had been observing and no doubt commanding the, the, force, the, the, the armed soldiers who crucified Jesus, when it was all done, he had watched and observed all things. He had heard Jesus speak. And he said, surely this was indeed the Son of God. And he's convinced. And we are convinced. And that's why we do this in remembrance of him. Jesus, moreover, thirsted longingly. He longed for an end, no doubt, to his passion to his suffering, humiliation. But he longed more importantly for the completion of his mission. It is accomplished. And so just after he uttered these words, I thirst, he also uttered and cried aloud, it is finished. I have completed the task the Father gave me. I have drained to the very dregs the cup that he gave to me for the salvation of the world, that you and I can take the cup of salvation as the psalmist anticipated and prophesied. It's all there. He longed, moreover, for the restoration of perfect communion with his heavenly Father, for theirs is a perfect love, an intimate love, Indeed, an infinite love that we cannot begin to measure. And he understood, of course, that his crown would follow his cross because he trusted intimately his father. But some of the most difficult words to read in the crucifixion depictions in the Gospels is the cry of dereliction. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? quoting Psalm 22. And that's how the psalm begins, but it ends with a triumph and the glory. Just like our Good Friday will soon, our morning on Good Friday turns to dancing on Easter Sunday morning. And it's important that we understand that that, that separation was an existential thing because he was suffering there upon the cross. There was, there was never a separation within the Godhead. But nevertheless, he felt it. Just as the darkness descended, so the darkness in his soul, so as the sin of the world was laid upon the sin offering. And I don't know how many of you are following with a reading challenge, but we're in Leviticus just now. And the symbolism is there. 
these burnt offerings, sin offerings, peace offerings, and the like. All these lambs and rams and the like. It's all there pointing to Christ. He thirsted longingly because he longed for this new covenant era which was bursting in, coming in like the sun rising on an Easter Sunday morning. He longed for the salvation of the world. And that's why Good Friday is so important. He died for our sins. He rose again for our righteousness. Finally, Jesus thirsted lovingly. He thirsted lovingly for his Father's glory. Everything he did, even in the garden, aware what, the, what this would cost. The one who was without sin and yet would bear the sin of the world. Understanding these things. And yet he said, Father, not my will be done, but yours. Such was his love for his Father, for his glory, for the glory of God. Moreover, he thirsted lovingly for his kingdom and his cause because he understood the necessity of it and the importance of it in making all things good. We're still not there. Not in, per not in a perfect sense in any meaningful way. But we are part of that kingdom. And one day it'll be brought up into perfection everlastingly. Jesus thirsted lovingly for you and me, for all who receive him. And he offers himself to everyone in the gospel. That's the good news. And that's what we commemorate and remember in the Lord's Supper, his body given for us, his blood, the blood of the new covenant shed that we might be recipients of God's grace, love, and mercy. And hence he says to us, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. Jesus says, this do in remembrance of me. Amen. And may the Lord add his blessing to these few thoughts this evening. Well, we're going to... Um, say together. We're going to affirm our common faith in the words of the, uh, the Nicene Creed. I'm sometimes asked why we don't say the Apostles' Creed. The Apostles' Creed is essentially a baptismal creed rather than a communion creed. And so the Church Universal tends to repeat the Nicene Creed at communion and uses the Apostles' Creed when we have a baptism. And there'll be two baptisms in the next two weeks. So we're going to be saying the Apostles' Creed soon as well. So we'll, the words are going to appear on the screen and we shall just say the words together, shall we? We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. 
We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us hear the words of institution. I'm reading in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We're reading from verse 23 down to verse 26. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us just bow our heads and give thanks. Our gracious God, our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for your rich provision. We thank you that you so loved the world that you gave the most precious thing that you had for us, for you gave your one and only Son. And we thank you for the, that he has given to us the, uh, the Lord's Supper, that we might remember, that we might commemorate and celebrate indeed that we might be united to him through faith and by the work of the holy spirit we thank you for this bread and this wine and we ask that you would take them and hallow them that they might be for us this evening the very body and blood of the lord jesus christ that we indeed would feast upon him by faith that our faith would be strengthened and that we might leave this place edified and encouraged through Jesus Christ our Lord. We thank you, O Lord, that we can look back, that we might look up and look forward to that day when we, we shall sup with him in his Father's kingdom. Bless us and be with us. Prepare our hearts and minds. Renew and forgive. In Jesus' name. There's a tradition in southeast Scotland, and I think possibly in parts of Northern Ireland, I think, and I think the connection would be southwest Scotland, southwest Scotland, that at communion they occasionally used shortbread. You're not getting shortbread, we've got bread. But on the night in which the Lord Jesus Christ was betrayed, he took bread and after giving thanks to his heavenly father he broke it and said this is my body which is given for you this do in remembrance of me in the same manner also after supper he took the cup saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood each time you drink it, do so in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim my death until I come. Let us eat and drink to the praise and glory of Jesus Christ. our special Good Friday service um, by singing uh, a very precious uh, 
him, amazing grace, how sweet the sound. conclude. And now as we leave this place of worship, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with each one of you now and forevermore.